So we're going to talk a little bit about um, resiliency versus disaster recovery. And what we had originally talked about is, you know, the difference between the two. And we actually kind of adjusted this a little bit to try to talk about, is there really a difference? Um, so we really want to talk about how these two, two concepts um, relate uh, to uh, our overall business continuity and capability to recover. So just uh, for those of you that may or may not be aware of, of who MHA is, this is um, who we are. Uh, we've been around for about 20 years. Um, the, uh, the consultants that we work with in our organization are um, very experienced, um, really average, uh, have been working in the industry for a long time, um, both not just as, a, as consultants, but uh, really on um, at various different types of organizations. Um, and our, our goal here really is to, to provide functional capabilities, not just, um, not just to give, um, you know, cookie cutter answers, but, but make sure that the, the information and the solutions that we help work with our, our clients with um, actually are customized to what they do. Um, we do have some tools um, that help with BIAs and um, uh, risk assessments and things like that as well. Um, just to let you know, this is, you know, we, we go across all of the different verticals and a lot of different organizations from large to small to mid-size. Um, so we've got a pretty good um, pedigree. Uh, I myself have, have gone across um, many of these different uh, verticals and, and currently have clients across multiple. So I think our experience um, helps. We see a lot of different things um, and can bring that into various organizations. Um, and and just so just so you do know, we do we do go across the entire um, suite of business continuity, um, disaster recovery, both on the business and on the technical side. So from assessments all the way up to uh, continuous improvement. Um, many of our our clients we have been with for multiple years. Um, so we may go in as an assessment and then come in and continue to assist. Um, but again, our goal is to make sure organizations are functional, not just that we just continue to have um, hours and engagements over the years. Um, the goal is really for our, our clients to be self-sufficient. Um, but again, we can do point solutions from just a quick assessment to uh, some staff augmentation to kind of helping the program you know, run all the, um, across the board, both um, on the BC side as well as on the disaster recovery side. Uh, we've got organizations that will come in and ask us to help with um, specific exercises or help with some documentation, um, training, you know, whatever it is. So whole program down to just pointed solutions as well. So with that, um, really kind of want to talk about the um, between disaster recovery and resiliency. What's, what's the difference? How do we talk about these two? Uh, what are the various components? Um, are they integrated? Um, you know, is one better than the other or, or how do they fit? Um, and uh, so that's hopefully what we're going to be. I don't know that we'll take the whole, the whole hour. Um, but definitely we'll have time for questions. But again, if you have anything, just jump in and, um, and ask your questions. Um, we'll probably get into some of the, the technologies, but this is really going to be more around um, some of the, the conceptual and, and needs around disaster recovery and resiliency, um, as opposed to a, a real technical implementation uh, kind of presentation. But we will talk about some of the technologies as well. Okay, so an important an important note for us is um, that you know overall resiliency and, and resilience really is this balance between risk um, and then the actual um, needs, right? Are we ready? Um, and putting the putting the plan, plans in place. So. Um, I think a, a goal that we want to look at here is not everything is the same. Um, everything that we look at is based on risk um, and both the risk to, um, to something occurring, but also the risk that an organization is willing to, to use. And, and I think an example of that today, a you know, very pertinent example is many organizations are trying to figure out what their risk profile is as it relates to the, you know, the COVID-19. There's organizations who have already gone to remote work. We've seen those in the news, and we actually have um, at least one client who has done that, probably appropriately so, by the way. 
Um, there are other um, organizations that are starting to suspend um, certain projects um, out of an abundance of caution. Again, their risk profile is very, very small. So when we think about this, there really isn't one answer necessarily, and we'll, we'll get into more details there. Um, just a quick uh, couple of things on risk, because this is really the underlying um, issue to everything we're gonna be talking about is, the crises and the, and the issues that we have go across the board. Um, and I think for me, one of the most important things to always remember is when you're doing your risk assessments is the biggest issues or the, the most impactful things or the most frequent issues that happen are those things that we like to call smoldering. They've been going on. People know something's happening, but they just kind of have been ignored or they've just kind of been hoped that they would go away as opposed to those sudden types of, of issues. Um, and so just as a note, as we, as we think about that, you know, understanding your overall risk is really important and that it isn't just about natural disasters or even pandemics. You know, a lot of the things that actually occur are outside of that. Um, the other important note here is just overall prioritization. And I think we know this, but sometimes we get so focused on the bottom one here, which is restoration of the business. We actually forget that the most important thing we're trying to do is make sure people are safe, make sure we stabilize the incident, um, make sure that our property or, or, or other assets are uh, preserved during any kind of incident or crisis, then we can think about restoration of the business. Now, it isn't necessarily completely linear like we talked about here, but um, understanding kind of from a prioritization perspective, this is typically how you would look at it. Um, and as I said, sometimes we go right to the bottom um, and just, to, you know, the two, the two um, outside pieces are what we look at, life safety and restoration of the business. And some of those pieces in the middle are, um, kind of embedded in, but not consciously thought about. So something to consider as we talk through these other concepts. Um, just uh, as you as you think about risk, compliant, um, and uh, business continuity, just make sure we understand what are the standards that your organization is responsible for. Um, there's multiples. Not all of them need to be used, um, nor do you have to be compliant in all of them. But if they are there, that may add some additional risk or may have some additional requirements as it relates to the overall resiliency or, or the disaster recovery position in your organization. Um, and then we like to measure these, you know, these various areas. And these are kind of the areas that you want to be resilient in. We'll talk about more, you know, more about those as we go, but um, resiliency in DR really goes across all of these, all of these pieces specifically. So as we said, underlying everything we do is risk management. So we just want to make sure that as we call things out that, you know, a risk, a risk management um, program or performing some type of risk analysis really is understanding those um, uh, events and issues that could occur, um, not necessarily will, but the probability of that, and also understanding the impacts to it from a business perspective, right? It isn't just that it's going to happen, but what is the actual um, impact of the business and certain risks are going to impact the supply chain more than they may impact the finance side or the sales side. So understanding all of that is really important. These are all underlying business continuity concepts, obviously, but want to make sure that we're always thinking about those you know, in, in relation to what we do. Because um, if we don't understand the why, the how and the what um, kind of can get muddled in there. So let's just kind of drop, drop into it. Um, in the end, um, you know, we, we kind of think about disaster recovery um, as the, the technical side of any kind of resiliency or recovery, right? And that's, um, that may include some high availability solutions. Um, typically, however, there's a delay between when there is an event um, going on and when service is restored, right? So we do our BIAs um, and we come back with requirements for our application recoveries, our RTOs and our RPOs. Um, then we go figure out what are we supposed to be doing? What are our, our DR solutions? And we'll talk about some of those technologies here in a little bit more detail. But you know, typically there's multiple things being done. We, we have replication, we have backups, we might have HA, um, there might be a data center, we might be leveraging cloud. Um, but again, it's all kind of based on these BIAs, RTO, RPO, and it's recovery, right? Um, and that's what it has been for years. Typically, this is all unplanned, right? Our normal day-to-day -day operational side for our planned events are going on. Um, and 
And then typically we are looking at this kind of from a data center perspective. Um, I think we're getting away from that idea of a full data center outage, but still many of our, our organizations and the clients we work with are looking at it from a data center perspective. What happens if our data center goes away? What do we do? Um, and how do we recover that? Um, on the flip side, resiliency, as we're starting to work with our, our organizations, is really thinking about the prevention of outages. Um, this also can include the day-to-day -day availability needs. It, it can include disaster recovery um, because that's a part of our of the overall resiliency. And we're going to talk more about that as we go further. Um, but it, it also includes overall technology, but it may include some non-technology pieces as well. Whereas disaster recovery outside of the plans and the things that support the recovery, we think in terms of recovering systems. How quickly do I get them up? On the resiliency side, we really want to be focusing more on overall functional focus. Um, is it actually capable? Um, it can be both a planned and an unplanned. One of the things that I think that we would note from an IT perspective is often our planned <laughs> events kind of turned into unplanned events because there's an outage that occurs that we weren't planning. There was um, a, uh, an impact that didn't happen. The change didn't really go as, as we had expected, and there are some um, unexpected um, impacts to that change. So really, when we start thinking about that, you know, the planned and the unplanned really is that resiliency side. You know, we don't invoke disaster recovery because it's a failover um, in most cases. Whereas resiliency, we're trying to make sure that everything is in, in place and um, functional as needed. Um, it's also going to be based that we talked about on the risk tolerance and risk appetite. So a, a retailer might have a certain um, level of risk and for their systems, especially their in-store systems. Um, and so those might have a much lower risk appetite, whereas some of the back-end systems would have a higher, whereas um, you know, a manufacturing site is going to be much more dependent on potentially their supply chain, um, you know, some of their manufacturing lines, and um, uh, will also depend on the actual impact of the various locations. So we really have to look at that. As, as we've talked about with, with the COVID earlier, some organizations are looking at um, being very overly cautious, you know, an abundance of caution, and so we're having people work from home. Other organizations are business as usual and they've just adjusted. They're not handshaking in meetings, but they really haven't stopped anything. So you really have to understand from a, an organizational perspective, again, what is your organization's risk and their tolerance for risk to come up with these appropriate um, resiliency positions, both DR and other. Um, also, we're, we're, we're pushing that, you know, from a resiliency, a resiliency perspective, it's really component and not necessarily full data center impact. There might be some impact, but it's really more at that component level as opposed to overall facility types of impact. It's really pushing it down to um, more functional services capability. So I kind of talked about this. I'm not going to spend it really any time, but just as, as a reminder about risk appetite versus risk tolerance as you're thinking about the resiliency in DR, right? Is the appetite is the overall broad level of risk? will accept the tolerance is the specific and the examples that we use there is you know insurance right are you going to have insurance or you're not going to have um insurance right do you have your financial reserves how are you handling that then your tolerance would be what's the size of your deductible are you going to have comprehensive versus non-comprehensive etc so that kind of helps you understand what level you know are you going to have from an appetite versus a tolerance and, and this really helps come up with the appropriate solutions for an organization it's one thing to say we're not going to worry about it we're just going to buy insurance you know for our sales it's another thing to say well no we've got to be able to keep functioning and then but we're willing to only recover that in three days versus immediate so i think those how those relate together from a, a business perspective there are these kind of four types of risk um again just want to remind you you've probably seen this in some of our previous uh, information really not going to spend any time there but between accepting risk, avoiding risk, limiting it, or transferring it to another organization. All of those are techniques that we would use in resiliency. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, the types of risks that we have, again, just real quickly there, it's not just technology that, you know, from an IT perspective we look at, but 
people can cause a technology issue. People can cause um, other types of impacts, whether it's intentional, unintentional. And then of course, between breaches and ransomware um, are a big deal um, and happening you know, all the time. Can't emphasize that enough. One of the things I would note is that from a resiliency perspective, as it relates to specifically to DR and technology, that brand image can be a big deal. And the example I like to use really is, you know, over the last several years, airlines have taken a hit for multiple reasons, but one of the things is their technology um, have had multiple issues. And so the technology side of things can actually impact the brand as much as other maybe potential bad decisions or um, mismanagement, et cetera. So let's think a little bit more in terms of the actual components around resiliency um, and talk about those a little bit. Um, so you can see them here. A um, couple of things I want to really call out is, as we were talking about, resiliency is about the capability to stay functional. Um, and I think an important note here is it really is the component to stay functional in an appropriate amount of time. We often think about resiliency in terms of high availability, or as I said before, the prevention of a service outage. And that is generally a true statement, but the prevention of a service outage could also mean the, the, the ability to be functional again in an appropriate amount of time. So meaning if a call center, um, needs to be available 24 seven, and that's the data they need. It could be that you know it's determined that the resiliency for that is, if there's a five minute blip where calls aren't coming through, that's gonna be okay. And so the service resiliency is ensuring that there never is more than a five minute outage. Often DR is we need to be recovered in X amount of minutes, X amount of time, X amount of hours or days. And that's a rough number. Um, we try to build to that, but we understand that that is going to happen, and it could go a little bit longer. And the example that I like to use is um, if somebody says, uh, we need to be available in 24 hours, and you get them up in 26, they're probably pretty happy, or even 30, they're probably happy, because it's in that range. When we're talking about resiliency, we're really talking about ensuring that whatever that availability need is, it is made and all of the, the pieces that need to be put in place are there so that you don't ever go over it. And I think that maybe might be the best distinction between disaster recovery and resiliency is DR is RTO-ish, resiliency is absolutely positively, we'll have it up within the amount of time that it, that it needs to be there or shorter. Even though that's what we talk about when we say DR, functionally we, we typically don't um, plan for that. So um, resiliency does have a DR component to it, right? We're gonna get more into that here on the next slide. But I think these other pieces are important. The end user technology and supporting business functions. Um, we often think in terms of you know, DR and big applications, what's running in the data center. And we don't spend enough time on the individuals. And so the example I li really think is important there is that whole, if a, if a tree falls in the, in the woods and nobody's there to hear it, you know, um, did, did it really make a sound? It's the same thing for our environments and our processing. If there are no people to use the systems, are the systems really um, functioning? Yeah, they're spinning, and we do that a lot in IT. Applications are running. I don't know what else to tell you, right? Well, this is kind of where the end user technologies that the business needs are important. It's one thing to have systems. It's another thing to make sure that those systems can be accessed. People have the right end endpoints to use them, and all of the supporting technologies, printers. Um, devices, um, any special equipment, any of that that they need to interface with that is also there. And I think often that kind of gets pushed to the side as it's really not in that important or people will always have it. And in reality, you know, if we use um, workstations or laptops, um, that that's the, that's the assumed way that people will access the environments at home or remote or even at an alternate location. But it turns out that people don't take them home. And we see that, you know, generally, 50 to 70 percent of the time, um, you know, people might take them home, but that leaves 30 to 50 percent that aren't. Are those, um, has that been addressed within your overall resiliency and your DR program? One important piece. 
the overall infrastructure and application support. Again, we think in terms of recovery, what about the ongoing support needs after that? Does it change at all? Do you need to have any special um, processes or um, uh, additional people to help with those support functions? Because it could be different. Or in order to be extra resilient, people need to be actually more on call so that the questions can be answered more quickly. Things like that. Single points of failure. I think this is one area that is um, really under considered when it comes to risk and in our, our resiliency position. Um, do you know what your single points of failure are? And are you making conscious decisions around them? Um, or are you just kind of ignoring them? And I, I think organizations are not spending enough time doing that analysis um, and understanding it and consciously being able to give that to management to say, here's the impact of these single points of failure. It's a one thing, it's a one thing to have it, it's another thing to understand the impact. We just did this with an organization where um, this is a manufacturer who has, has a single foundry. And if that foundry goes away, the company stops because all of their, many of their um, foundational components come out of that foundry. So without it, they really have no other solution to get it. Um, and then within that foundry, there are certain single points of failure that obviously they're not going to have redundancy because of cost, but that um, resiliency for that, those components are vitally critical because they can't ever go down. So again, understanding those single points of failure are, are key. People. Um, right now, that's a big deal because we're looking at, at the COVID um, and, and coronavirus issue. But more important than just pandemics, which I'm um, not going to spend a lot of time on because, I, well, I may, um, but I think we understand that. But the people side of this, do you have enough um, knowledge within the, the set of people to perform all of the functions, are they capable of, of working wherever they need to? Um, a big piece to the people often is the idea of, yeah, they can work, but we forget about the ancillary portions. What happens if their personal lives get in the way? Is there enough um, resilience in place for other people or to allow them to take care of their personal lives while the crisis is going on, if it overlaps a little bit? And I think this current idea of this pandemic, if we use that, is a perfect example of that. There may be the case where people are able to work from home, um, and those, are, those um, aspects and technology are in place, and the capacity is there. But as soon as people start getting sick, or their family members get sick, they're getting pulled away. So even though the capability is there, the, the availability may not be there. And so has that been addressed within an organization? And specifically as it relates to DR is, now we got to start thinking about what does that do for the support side for the rest of the organization? IT departments are becoming less and less uh, or becoming more and more lean. And a lot of individuals with specific knowledge, even though there might be some uh, backup, the backups really don't have the uh, detailed knowledge that the primary folks do. And so if there's an extended period of outage for that primary person, more than just a few days because of vacation, and we'll just wait for them to come back, there isn't that opportunity. And so there is a decrease in the ability of IT to service the rest of the organization. Pandemic um, pieces, um, we wrote, we've written a lot over the last you know, couple of weeks about pandemics. I would refer you to you know, the MHA website for that. But generally, I can we can tell you that uh, a pandemic resiliency, we're seeing how many, many organizations are just not prepared for this. They're rushing now to become prepared. What do we need to do about our workforce? Is there enough capacity um, in uh, our remote um, VPN or our, our uh, remote access environments? Do the people even know how to do it? Um, do we have the right HR policies? Some of this may not be pertinent to technology, but it's going to impact um, the, uh, the implementation of that. And then supply chain and third parties. Um, from a resiliency perspective, from a technology side, really understanding what technologies could impact the supply chain. But more so than that, organizations need to make sure they understand what are the supply chain issues. Um, and are there then technology um, support that could have, that is required to support them in whatever workarounds that they might put into place. But at least understanding the supply chain is very key. Um, and a lot of times the, the technology side of things is just assume to keep the systems up, which is correct. But I think IT also understanding what are what is the supply chain impact. There might be additional solutions that um, the technology side could provide, or at least ideas to support it. 
Um, so really looking at that supply chain is key if that's if that's part of your organization's um, uh, critical functions. Some may not have to worry about their overall supply chain, but in most organizations, that's key, especially today, going back to the pandemic and the, um, those issues. Because we're such a global um, community today, impacts in different parts of the country start impacting um, organizations here, even if organizations are um, serviced by only U.S. companies, those vendors are probably sourced outside of the U.S. And so they're going to be impacted, which means your organization. Will be. And then overall third party. And we're becoming more and more dependent on third party, especially from a technology perspective. Our, our cloud-based um, services are just increasing um, exponentially in every organization. And so we've transferred a lot of our risk to these third parties. And again, from a DR perspective, from a technology day-to-day -day perspective, we're just saying, well, I've given that to Amazon. I've given that to um, Salesforce. They're responsible for it, which is an absolutely true statement. However, it's while they're responsible for the execution, they're not responsible for your business and your functions. It's still the responsibility of the organization to make sure that the appropriate plans are in place and not just turn it over to say, well, Microsoft will handle that and they're gonna do, um, they'll always make sure they're available. Um, what, are the, what are the issues? What are the risks for those third parties? Um, and then are there other uh, technology solutions, workarounds that need to be put in place um, for those third parties, not just do they have a disaster recovery? Any questions or comments on um, that kind of that resiliency piece before we jump into the DR? All right, so I'm actually changing this a little bit. Um, I'm calling this not disaster recovery, but technical resiliency. Because in the end, here I'm gonna, I'm gonna tip my hand for kind of the end. In the end, there is no difference between disaster recovery and resiliency. One is a component of the end, which is what we just saw above. Disaster recovery is part of resiliency. But as we think about technical resiliency, right, or disaster recovery. It's all of the things that we've been doing for years, right? What is our BI in integration? Do we understand the RTOs and RPOs based on business requirements for a recovery? Um, do we understand change management? Is it integrated so that our disaster recovery um, environment remains in sync with our production environment? Or at least we know what those changes are and we ensure that they're happening. The data protection strategies, right? Replication, backup, um, um, et cetera. Do, are those in place, do we, are those tied back to the RTO RPOs um, or are they just best, best effort um, because of what we hear from our day-to-day -day side of things? Our overall recovery strategy, right? again, that goes back to BIA integration. What do we have? Do we have an appropriate alternate site? Are we recovering in a hybrid mode from an alternate site to, a, um, to also using cloud recovery? What is, our, what is our position? And if we are productively in the cloud, where we're using maybe an IaaS or a PaaS, do we have the appropriate recovery strategy there? Or are we just relying on their, um, our cloud services um, availability um, commitments versus having an alternate cloud um, presence or an alternate recovery um, region outside of the one that we're primarily running? Something to think about there. Our documentation side of recovering, the procedures, um, the execution steps, the contact list, all of that is a part of um, DR our exercise and testing, right? Exercise and testing is more than just doing an annual recovery. It's the table talks. It's sitting down with, with folks and making sure their documentation flows correctly. It, it's the appropriate level of information. Um, making sure that we're exercising appropriately, integrated. It's not just, yeah, we're flipping things up and the server's turned on or the application started up when we did a login, right? It's integration testing. And then today, because of our, our use of the, the our third parties and our SaaS solutions and our cloud solutions, are we integrating those as part of our test? Or are we just keeping it isolated to our responsibility and assuming that, well, wherever we fail over to, we'll be able to connect to the um, to our partners, including them in the testing is critical. Um, I've already kind of talked about maintenance, technology plans, um, but that maintenance is really key. One of the things we see within um, our overall technical resiliency is the DR side of things tends to lag behind. I'm in the middle of planning several exercises for folks um, right now. 
And it's amazing to me that we spent weeks, sometimes months planning these exercises and fixing everything in the DR environment so that the test will work. And my point to everyone is, your test failed. And they're like, no, our test was great. I said, no, your test wasn't great. It took you three months to get ready to perform a test. If we had had to execute um, this test two months ago, it wouldn't have worked because there were these portions that would not have been recoverable. So explain to me how your test worked. A test is only as good as, can I drop everything and perform it right now? Now, the, from a planning perspective and an organization, I'm all about that, right? We can't just necessarily drop everything we're doing. But when there are significant technical fixes that are in place to ensure the tests work, that's a problem. And so that's kind of where the maintenance side is glaring, where we don't maintain our environments um, very well. And that just hurts our overall resiliency because we're relying on that recoverability um, in, in the event that we have to quickly do it. And then the training and awareness side of the technical resiliency. Are there, are the right people in place? Do they have the skills? Do they know what to do? Do they know where the information is? Do they even know what the strategy is? Right. So often our primary folks are the ones or the ones that architected it are the ones that do the testing, write the documentation, and um, are, are the ones um, executing everything. And so they're really aware of what it is. You take that down to the secondary or even tertiary people or, or people that, you know, the service desk individuals and say, do you know what our recovery strategy is? No clue. Oh, well, the infrastructure team will do that. Yeah, but do you know what they're going to do? Do you know where it's going to happen? Do you know, um, you know what the general strategy is? Understanding all of that for technical folks is really important, especially on um, maybe the non-infrastructure side. When I talk to, to application teams and say, do you know how this works? No, that's the infrastructure problem. They just tell me when the systems are up. Well, that's great, but there's probably a lot of information that you need that in case there's a problem, you need to know how it's being done, where it's being done, the timing of it so that you can help troubleshoot. So that's the, the DR side of things. Any questions? All right, let's talk about technology. Um, again, we're not gonna dive deep into this, but I think it is important that we understand that really from a resiliency perspective and from a DR perspective, the tool sets are all the same. There's going to be alternate workspaces. Do you have to have something ready for someone to move into because they cannot work from home? There is a cultural issue. Um, this may not be a, a technology problem, but an understanding and asking the question is important. It's one thing to say we can everybody can work from home. It's another thing to say from a business process perspective or from a culture perspective, people can't do it for the long term. We have multiple um, organizations that we deal with that say, yeah, we can work from home for a couple of days. And we're like, well, if you can work from home for a couple of days, why can't you work from home indefinitely? Our people don't do well with remote collaboration. They need to be in the same location. Um, they need to talk, they need to whiteboard, they need to whatever. And so it's okay. So while it isn't a hard technology or a hard business process, it's a cultural issue. So there may be a need to plan for space, which then means what about remote access? You know, um, a VDI solution, some type of remote desktop solution or a VPN in. It's so important to be looking at the capacity. That's, that's a hot topic right now for folks, but those tool sets as it relates to both um, a recovery of a data center or just day-to-day -day resiliency when somebody has to run home quickly or a group um, has to leave um, because of a problem with that section of the building. Does all of that exist? Do they all know what's what's in place? Um, and is there the right capacity? We're seeing many organizations are saying, we only build this for our work from home, day-to-day -day position for remote access. So it might be for 100 people. Well, now you need 500. Licenses aren't there. The capacity, or if, even if there are licenses, the um, VPN concentrator or the VDI environment isn't set up to support that. Um, a real key to that overall capability. Data center side of things or your alternate data center, I think that's you know a pretty well understood concept, but I think the idea of does your data center um, fail over appropriately and what does that mean from a remote data center, your cloud services? Um, do you have all of that set up appropriately? Do you have the appropriate um, availability zones that things can, can fill over to? 
and the appropriate processes in there as well. Um, we talked single points of failure, um, redundant hardware. Is your hardware actually redundant? Um, or do you just have other components that you're gonna um, put in when something fails? Again, understanding the, the resiliency need doesn't need to be highly available. Does it need to be in a clustered mode? Does it really just need to be um, two different servers that I can spin one up if I need to? This is especially important for physical servers. While much of our organization is virtual, I, I can't, I, I really can't think of an organization we're dealing with that is primarily a physical server environment, but so many of them um, still have important um, and significant um, applications or processes running on physical machines that they just can't get rid of. And those are kind of just discounted. And so that redundant hardware, even if it's just available, um, that it can be put in and recovered from, from a backup, sometimes it's not considered. I, I do have a client that they have a, a significant number of old um, physical servers that um, are running older operating systems that because of um, the inability to upgrade the application, they're still running on those. And that's their biggest risk. Their virtualization environment, failover is pretty good. But it's these other pieces that they don't have. And so that's fine. And while, while we would hope that they could migrate those maybe to a virtual solution or something new or even into the cloud or a SaaS solution, the problem today is they can't, but they don't have the hardware that if that hardware fails, that they can restore to. They're just going to hope they can go get it on the open market. Well, it's older, it's harder to get. So really that redundancy isn't just about you know, our, our new critical stuff that we have failed over. It's really about the older stuff and the one-offs that you need to have in the case of some type of resiliency need. And typically that might not be the first piece that needs to be recovered, but it's not that far after or as a dependent application. Um, the backup and restore side, I would also say is an area that is really underutilized from a technical resiliency perspective. A lot of backups, um, ad hoc restores, but the ability to do like your tier three and tier four, which typically um, are those that need to be restored in the case of some type of um, failure or outage event, that is not well tested. Um, it's just assumed that, well, because we do restores on an ad hoc basis for files and, and a one server, this will work. Technically, we know it works, right? There's not a technical problem, but there could be process problems. There could be pieces that are missing in the backup. Um, it's why we do DR exercises and, and we practice to kind of see, yeah, we got this recovered, but oh, we forgot about the load balancer on this because it's a special one, or we forgot about um, this dependent um, authentication environment that is one off for this environment. It isn't part of our normal LDAP or um, AD environment. So those backup and restores have the same concept. It's like we missed this important file system because we just assumed that it wasn't needed. When in actuality, there are certain files that are different, or there are, there are log files there that if they aren't there, um, the application won't start. So using those in terms of um, exercises and review the environment, not just assuming that it's all there um, is important. Um, the replication um, side, again, I don't know that we need to spend a ton of time here. Um, but it can be used more, for, more than just for recovery. Um, the high availability solution, or even if it doesn't have to be highly available, being able to do things at the component level. Um, I guess what I would say from a replication you know, storage and server is, can you do it at the component level? Can you just, um, are you replicating at the storage layer so that individual servers or, or functions or applications can be restored, or is it, all of them have to come up. So an example I, I use there is a client that we have um, leverages um, recover point and SRM, you know, VMware's SRM. Well, they can't just recover certain servers. They have to they have to recover a set of servers because of how their replication is set up. Well, that's that old school concept of we're going to recover the data center, and that's fine if that's your resiliency position. But understanding as we're talking more today, this is about the ability to, to keep services running appropriately. And it may be something that even though it's a recovery situation, you need to only do one database or this application. And if it's all tied together, you've now kind of invoked a DR event versus a resiliency position. Um, 
I think we've hit cloud services pretty well um, in terms of that. But one thing I would just say is as, a, as an IT department um, and we're a group responsible for technology, making sure that those cloud services um, have the appropriate um, protections that are in place. A big piece of cloud services goes back to the backup and the store. What um, is needed to protect the data? We just assume that we often the assumption is organizations, the, the vendor is doing a backup and can restore your data. Generally, that's a true statement, but it's your data. And so you're, if you're turning over the backup um, service to the vendor, that's fine, but it is your data. And in the end, if you think about it, if they fail, you can sue them and you can get a settlement, but that isn't gonna bring your data back. And I think that's an important concept, right? Today, if we're not doing a backup, we just don't sue ourselves or we just don't say, well, we have insurance. We ensure that we can get the data back. That's why we do the backups in your stores. So at least understanding there may be a need for some of your cloud services that you have a special backup, right? Um, great example is Microsoft, you know, O365 right now. There are multiple um, third party solutions that will back up your O365 data so that you know you can have it in case something happens if Microsoft can't get it back. And it's important enough for many organizations to do that. MHA is one of those. Um, we do our own backups because we have to know we can get it um, back. If there's a problem, we just can't rely on a, a financial payment. Um, now, high availability versus recoverability. Um, I, I, I assume you all understand this, but I do want to call it out because it's often, maybe outside of, of IT and technology, but even within IT and technology, I hear these are considered synonymous. I'm gonna have a high availability solution and or I need to be recoverable, which means high availability or DR means high availability. Um, they really are different concepts. High availability is a service doesn't go down. It's clustered. It immediately fails over with seconds of um, downtime or a blip that um, the, the application really doesn't stop functioning from an end user perspective. That's high availability, right? High availability is not necessarily failure, recover. It's, it's flip over, service doesn't go down within seconds. That's how I like to define that. Recoverability is, can you recover in the time frame that you're anticipating or that is required? Um, and so resiliency, disaster recovery, that's all about what's the appropriate recoverability. I would put high availability as a type of recoverability. It just means you're not technically recovering. It doesn't need to be recovered because it's always available. So an important note there as you think about your tool set. Richard? Yes. This is Catherine. Um, you've got about 15 minutes left. Yep. Okay, you have some questions too, so keep that in mind. Okay, no problem. I'm just gonna run through a couple more things. Um, kind of what we said here is um, availability, um, you know, of solutions and processes, you know, can be separated from DR or DR is the solution. So one of the things that we talk about here is you may decide that high availability is needed for your day-to-day -day operations, but then that can also be your DR solution. That's really the message here. DR can always exceed your RTO on RPO. So often from a, an availability perspective, it just makes sense to include that as your DR solution versus trying to have an availability solution and a DR solution. Um, really the last thing I really wanted to get to, um, there's a few other pieces here, but from, a, from an IT um, DR perspective is tier zero services. These are the ones that we would, that used to, we would usually say it have to be resilient, meaning they need to be highly available. Your network, right? You've gotta be in two locations. Um, the telephony side of things. Um, that may be highly available, but depending on your architecture, um, you may have to have some type of redundant service. It might be a limited service and it might be a cloud service, but that telephony really needs to be there. Many organizations that we're seeing still have some hardware dependencies on campus um, that is, that is uh, not allowing them to be fully highly available across multiple locations. So something really to consider there, but at least have an alternate service that will keep your telephony up. Um, don't just assume that cell phone is your redundant service. 
Um, too often that just, while is a good backup, it isn't necessarily the, what you want to do for your overall environment and or the ability to forward phones to cell phones um, or extensions to cell phones can be an important pieces as well. The authentication side goes really back with LAN LAN. You've got to have that redundant. You really don't want to have to fail that over um, necessarily, or it has to be such a quick failover because there's so many dependencies. If it's not there automatically, your high availability won't work um, for one thing. And even as you're recovering, if systems are coming up without that authentication, they often will fail, they'll hang, you have to reboot them. It just doesn't work well. Um, don't forget your security monitoring. Um, and then we, we spent quite a bit of time also on remote access and redundant components, the capacity, your end user devices, and then your uh, mobile device management. What happens if people lose their device? Can you wipe them remotely? Can you get them a new one? Um, what is their, what is your ability to support people that don't take their end device with them? Are you going to use a BDI? Are you just going to have a depot? Do you have a device as a service? Um, you really need to look at all of those. So um, let me pause right there. Well, let me go to um, the kind of talk through all of those things. Um, let me get to the single points of failure. Um, we talked about that, I think, in, in pretty much detail. Um, just want to make sure that you kind of look at your, your constraints from a, a single point of failure perspective um, and cross-training documentation. I, I think people are some of our biggest single points of failure. I really want to call that out because it's just as important as the technology. So um, really the end, end conversation here is there is no difference between DR and resiliency. Resiliency is about keeping services up and making sure that they're available in the appropriate amount of time. Um, disaster recovery is a portion of that, right? It's your data center. It's your ability to recover when a disaster occurs, right? But resiliency is, it's always available no matter what the issue is. Um, and so that's where I think we need to be really thinking about our capability from an IT perspective. How do we build things so that they are resilient appropriately? Whether that is a recovery solution, whether that's a component level solution, whether that's an availability solution in data center, out of data center, um, all of that needs to be reviewed together. Um, so I'm going to stop there and maybe answer some of the questions and then we can kind of continue talking if, if we want to. So Catherine, where do I get those questions? They're in your chat window. Okay. All right, um, so I'm gonna go from um, the bottom. So, you know, one of the questions is, what about the inability or lack of training in managing a crisis? Um, I think that's a really good call out. Um, we didn't include, I probably should have, so that's probably a, a miss there um, on my part um, to a certain extent, is being able to manage a crisis that's really that crisis management side of resiliency which is a, a, an important component is both from a business perspective as well as an it perspective one of the first things that we do is not only making sure that the technology recovery is there but also the ability to manage a crisis and have a um, uh, an it emergency response team and train them um, and we recommend you do that at least on an annual basis and you have a, a specific plan around managing the crisis, not just recovering the environment. Um, so I think that's a really good call out, Blair, and, and appreciate you asking that. Absolutely critical to your overall resiliency um, and the ability to manage. Um, so the other question was, don't have required plans as part of the overall tool set. Um, that I, hopefully that came out in in the discussion is we do believe that the documentation is part of the overall um, piece from a common tool set perspective I was thinking more on the technology side versus about um, the the documentation but the documentation is absolutely critical um, and should be part of any kind of uh, resiliency position um, and DR position um, one of the things the note that I would make there is that um, the first thing that we want to make sure of is that do you have a functional capability versus spending a lot of time on documentation? Um, you know, we're very checklist based on our documentation side. So while it's very important, we want to make sure it's there. We also want to make sure that from a functional capacity capability, 
Can you actually recover? Is your environment actually resilient? Do you have all the components in place? That's a piece that I, I see as lacking, that we do do our documentation, but it quite honestly often is not that um, functional. It's done for a checkbox as opposed to really to be done functional. So absolutely would call that out. Um, you want to have your business continuity plans, your emergency plans, crisis management, DR recovery plans, checklists. All of those are really key. Um, but if you actually can't recover, those plans are the, the crisis management plans and you know some of the emergency response plans may be important for the overall process. But the technology side, um, you want to make sure that that is functional and in place and that those those documents match up with what you're doing. So I don't want to minimize it by any stretch, but also want to make sure that we're we're really looking at resiliency as the appropriate level of recovery, as well as the documentation um, as well. So um, I think that's all the, those are some of the questions. Are there any other questions or any other um, information you'd like me to share? All right, we've got about seven minutes left. So I think with that, um, you will have access to all of the other information um, on, the, on the, the presentation. I think we went through everything, kind of going through those components. Um, I hope there was some, some benefit here for you to start really thinking about um, how in your organization, you need to be looking at a resiliency position versus just a disaster recovery position. Um, and how do those really interact how do you leverage all of the processes, the people, um, your third parties, um, you know, as it relates to your overall resiliency, um, as opposed to just a let's recover a data center um, concept. So with that, if you do have any questions um, after the fact, please, uh, my, um, I think my contact information is here. Um, and you are more than welcome to um, reach out, ask me any questions, give me a call. I'm happy to have a conversation with you. And obviously, that's, you know, we don't charge for anything like that. I'm happy to have, you know, 10, 15 minute conversation with you at any point in time. Send me a note, give me a call, um, set up a time. Um, would love to, would love to talk to you. So with that, we will let you go. Again, thank you for joining us and I uh, hope you have a good rest of the day.